I will be talking about Story Engine. And uh, I will be doing this with some fun pictures from School Arts, because that's what I do. These pictures have almost nothing to do with the talk. They're just something cute to look at, because we're all kind of tired and uh, we need to look at cute things. So, the first thing I'm going to do is talk about if you have this fader, the story engine fader, you have competitive at one end and collaborative at the other. Now, a competitive game, you could say that I can beat you at this game. If you view LARP as a game that is winnable in, in some way or another, where we compete, Maybe it's the question of, of uh, like, I'm leveling in this game. Maybe it's a question of, of uh, there's a, a win condition that not everyone can achieve. And this picture is, by the way, from a horrible dystopian science fiction game. They are now looking at this girl to see if the, she has the invisible alien bug, which will make her crazy and start killing people. But that has nothing to do with competitive. Then we have collaborative. This is where you view a lot not as a, as a challenge to win or overcome, but as a collective experience that you will build. Uh, and here we have some 18th century nuns who are about to smuggle some noblemen out of France. Uh, and this is from there are different LARP cultures in the world, and they have very different emphasis on whether you are you do collaborative games or if you do competitive games. The Nordic LARP tradition that we are working in here mostly is extremely collaborative. So a concept like play to lose, just quick, hand in the air, who are familiar with the term play to lose? Okay. Uh, when you play to lose, that means that you ruin things for your character because it makes a good story, pretty much. So instead of saying, maybe my character is a very ambitious politician, uh, and I really want to be president. Now, I could play this character and like, really, like, I'm going to work this lark, and at the end of it, I'm going to be president, perhaps a pony president. Uh, but what I might also do, is right into my character, like decide, my character has a secret <coughs> drinking problem. Also, my character has a really bad past that might catch up to me. And then I make sure that other <coughs> players in this game know about this. Because to me, maybe it's a lot more interesting to play the story of you know, the rising star who, who falls <coughs> on the finish line. And then I am playing to lose, I'm not trying to succeed in the game. Which, is very much on the collaborative side. I'm going to give an example, and this is actually from a real uh, when we did Napona. This is a different part of the game than the one you played. But these are some very young and happy partisans. Uh, I'm going to talk about Napona as if it was a competitive game and then a collaborative game. And let's see if that makes it a little bit clearer. If you would play Snapone competitively, you could view it as a strategy game. I know that some of you have been playing uh, Avalon at night, which is kind of a, a board game about who is the traitor, let's find out who is the traitor. And you could play Snapone that way. And if you see it that way, then maybe every character or every player's mission is to free their character, to make sure that no matter what happens, then my character is not the one going to a labor camp in the end. And this could be kind of an exciting game, kind of like playing a strategy game like Risk or other more advanced board games. If you would play Snap on it collaboratively, as I would argue that we did here, uh, it's not a strategy game, it's a tragedy, or maybe a satire. And you see, now we've like, we're not even like, what kind of game is it? Before, it was, like, it was important that it was a game, and now the game part just isn't very important at all. 
The important thing is the story or the experience. So now the player mission is to develop your character, to do interesting things with your character, to like bring it out, to show it to the other players, to make interesting experiences. For instance, I know that in my run of the game, one character uh, sacrificed themselves for the good of the group to go into labor camp. Now, if we would have played this competitively, that would have meant that she was the loser of the game. Like she had the worst, that was the worst thing you could do. When you play it collaboratively, co collaboratively, that would be a fantastic thing to do. And it's a pretty clear thing, like you can see clearly in our after discussion, no one said to her like, why would you do that? Like why would you mess up the game for yourself? No one said that. People said it was awesome. That was such a, like an interesting choice you made. So quite clearly we, at least in my group, we were playing this game very collaboratively. And it's important to say, and I'm sure every person has said this in Fader Talks, that it's not a right and wrong, like we should be playing collaboratively, we shouldn't play competitively. Uh, if you would play the sport of football collaboratively, it would make no sense. Like really, don't try to play collaborative football, that would just be dumb. On the other hand, there are other games that, and also, I mean, there are many LARP cultures, if you would play North American Fantasy LARP collaboratively, all the other players would just think that you were like, in the wrong place, because that's not how it's played. And that is perfectly fine and completely valid. If you would, on the other hand, try to play White Death, and I actually haven't played White Death myself, but from what I've heard of it, if you would play White Death competitively, that's like, like how would you even do that? Like, it, it's, that's not a, it's not that kind of LARP. So that's it. That's what collaborative and competitive is. So how do I, I mean, I have decided in my heart of hearts that I would like to make a collaborative game or I would like to make a competitive game. How do I go about that? Uh, this is actually, by the way, the same scary science fiction game. We have a young soldier here who's about to go on a dangerous mission. Um, what you can do is explicit player instruction, explicit as in like saying it, just saying it. Like this game is not about winning. Don't try to play this game like you're gonna win. Then you're pushing your players, of course, in the simplest way possible toward collaboration. You can also set the tone pre-game with verbal cues and non-verbal cues. And my example here is going to be from Snapona as well. Do you guys remember that we started before the game, I talked a little bit, and then characters from the game started coming up on stage and talking. Now what we did with the costumes we wore, or I didn't wear a costume <coughs> then, but the costumes they wore and the way they spoke, we gave you a lot of cues <coughs> that this is a serious game, this has to do like somehow it's, it's kind of about politics, but it's also like the human suffering in politics. And, and there were like a, a very much a tone of this is going to be a tragedy. We could have had a thing on stage where we talk about, um, well, you could have had more of a system where it's like a win or lose thing. And well, the partisans might win or the military might win. Who's gonna win? And then we're pushing it toward competitive. And about that, this depends like how hard you have to push your game in, in one of the two directions for it to end up where you want it to end up. That relies heavily on the, the target audience. This audience here, at least right now, you are, I would say, very oriented toward collaboration. You've now been like practicing LARPing and you've been told over and over again how what we do here is that we collaborate. Maybe not verbally, like maybe we haven't say, said collaborate, but the kind of games you've been playing. So you will assume 
that you're going to collaborate. And if I want you to do a game that's very competitive, then I'm going to have to push hard for this. However, if I'm working with non-players or non-LARPers, if I am, for instance, in a school with 15-year-olds, which is something I am a lot in my job, then if I want them to play collaboratively, I am going to push and push and push. Because their, um, how they do games, when they hear the word game at all, or anything really, they try to find the competition in it. Because that's how we teach our kids to interact. We teach children to compete. And, and that's like a super central thing and I can only talk about Sweden here because I'm not like an anthropologist. <coughs> no stuff about anyone else. But in Sweden, competition is such a core part of our culture that that's how they will generally read any situation. Um, what else? Game mechanics. You can have game mechanics in your game that will encourage competition or will encourage collaboration. For instance, and, and this is just one example, um, a, a very good way to control if it's competitive or collaborative is fiddling around with the openness fader. A very transparent game is probably going to be also very collaborative. For instance, if you have um, <coughs> monologues in the game, where characters tell each other what they're really thinking, which gives away all their secrets, then this fosters, like this is a, a way of telling your players that we don't want you to play to win. We want you to create a story together. But there are also other game mechanics, of course. You can have, uh, in the game, you can have a, a, a Competitions that not everyone can win. Uh, and that kind of thing. So, why would you want to design for competition? First of all, it is super playable. As I said, people who don't do, like, who don't LARP, they don't get LARP, but they do get competition. Uh, especially young players and new players. If you have a kind of competitive game where you're not competing like one on one, but you have one group against another group, that is some quick and efficient team building right there. Um, many players really enjoy competing. It's fun. Also, and this is kind of the hard one, it demands less responsiveness from the players. And this means that if we are playing collaboratively, I have to have like my eyes with me the whole time through the game, like seeing like, is that person having fun? What's going on over there? Is, that, is, is she trying to play out a secret to me that I have to, like, do something with? And you don't really have to do that when it's a competitive game, because then you just kind of do your thing. Why design for collaboration? Even for players who are only used to competing, it's fun to collaborate, especially like, this is not what we do normally. This is like a, a completely different way of playing a game, of interacting. Uh, when you actually get it right, this will give a much deeper experience. It is a more emotional experience to play uh, White Death or Huntsville than to, to play a board game, if you get it right, if you get into the game. If you don't get into the game, you probably just stand there going like, um, these people are really weird. Uh, it's also more playable in the long term. If you have like two families fighting and that's our game, that might be fun for two hours. It's not going to be fun for a week because it's a really shallow conflict. Again, if you're successful, it's playable. If people get into the game. Also, it fosters community. It teaches us to take care of each other. It teaches us to build something together, to build social networks when successful. Also, many players don't enjoy competition. The last thing I'm going to talk about, this actually is a picture that has something to do with something. This is an example of how to design for this fader and how to move it mid-game. This is from a game called Trollringen, the Troll Ring, which is a fairy tale game. We have two young goblins here. Uh, now the first half of this game you have two competing witches in the forest, and they have 
all their little forest creatures with different magical powers. And they are all looking for a, a set number of treasures, and they want to have the most of these treasures. And this is the story of the game, and there's a whole story, like why would they want to do that? And the game is designed so that in the middle of the game, the little forest creatures, this would be the students in the game, realize that the witches are not really doing this, they're not, like, this is not a smart thing to do. They don't have a, like, why don't they collaborate instead? Because that would be a better way to reach their goals. So that you still have NPCs going like, I don't like her, you should get all the treasures. And the little go goblins going like, like, this is not, this doesn't make sense. And then the children kind of take over the LARP, hopefully. And uh, yeah. So in the beginning, to get them into the game, it's very competitive, and they get into the like the competition of it, uh, like nobody's business. But then we try to transform the game to be more of a deeper, like taking the role on a deeper level, and um, and just make it more of a story. And that is the talk. <coughs>